Welcome to the Stand on Your Investment podcast, presented by UC Hunting Properties and Expedition Land Management, where professionals from around the country will dive deep into land management strategies, investing in recreational real estate, and all things hunting. Welcome back, folks. Stand on Your Investment podcast brought to you by UC Hunting Properties and Expedition Land Management. We're back in Albia today. Um, excited to have Steve Hansen with Hawkeye Farm Management and Real Estate joining us today. Uh, as always, our good buddy, uh, Nate Ammons, is with us as well. Uh, Kurt Heddington here, Travis Homley, and Chris Van Gerpen joining the crew like normal. Uh, today's going to be a treat for the listener. Um, I would put Steve in a category that I'm for sure jealous of, at least being an outsider looking in. Um, Steve's got a, uh, a a pretty famous outfitting business here in, in Iowa and straight out Arrow Outfitters. Um, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you. Just give us a little background so the listeners know who you are. I'm, I'm sure they've probably heard of you or maybe even listened to a podcast with you on it before. But Yeah, I've, um, I've been in the area since the early 90s. Um, came here, you know, started an outfitting business. And then, um, you know, that's led me into this real estate business and also the land management stuff. And, um, you know, people always ask, hey, how are you able to put all this together and manage all these different divergent things? But it's basically just by being able to build a team. You know, basically the outfitting business now runs 100% without me, which is great. Let's me focus more on the real estate and some of the bigger picture items. I still keep a hand in the outfitting business because a lot of the landowners have worked with me for so long. I think they would feel if if I bailed on them, they may look for other options. Sure. And as long as I'm involved, it kind of keeps everything everything together. Plus, a lot a high percentage of our hunters are repeat guys. So even though I say I'm not going to guide, I keep showing up and guiding when I don't have to. You know? <laughs> Can't do it, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. You know? And then they, uh, my partners, which do a great job running, and I'm sure they roll their eyes because half the time I can't find the stands or stuff. But, um, yeah, so that's kind of how we do it. So a couple things, Steve, on that, and, and, and I mean, I appreciate that was an incredibly short who I am. Yeah. Um, what I want to know, and, and I think what's interesting is, I mean, something brought you to – this area iowa in general obviously you're not from here you didn't grow nope. up around here nope. um but clearly you had the same disease we all share in in loving chasing big deer um i'm thinking of it like if a listener or a potential client was listening you know they may be the same guy you were 20 years ago or whatever sure um why why here why then you know I, yeah how, how you did that know, whole thing start you know i grew up in illinois uh suburbs of chicago and we, you know, had little tiny spots to hunt or public land spots. I mean, we used to have to, they only allowed so many people a day. We'd sleep in our truck, so we made sure we had a place to hunt in the morning. And, um, but I did, at a very early age, see the progression of the hunting land. And what happened there was definitely like a preview to what was going to happen in the rest of the Midwest, you know. And, and so when I came over here, which was a, just a chance encounter with a guy who had started a small outfitting business and he invited me over here to help him. Um, when I got over here, I kind of said, holy cow, this is like going back in time. And that's, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and so I, at that time, I was fortunate enough, I was in a small way able to capitalize on some of the land market. And then like we all know, once you have your own farm, that's when you start learning all the management stuff and there's no better way to learn it than on your own you know and make all the mistakes ahead of time fueled by fire yes yeah. exactly and um yeah so that's kind of how i ended up over here and that's what sort of led me you know to once the outfitting business was stable you know get that in the hands of some guys that are truly better at it now than i am and let them run it and i'm you know focusing on the real estate and some land management stuff plus a lot of my own farms and investment stuff like that so. sure sure so steve let, let's dive into the 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 real estate and land management yep. piece because i think especially in in your role your clients are you're probably attracting clients because of the fact that you Absolutely. have expertise far and beyond you know an average real estate agent right right i always you know i always kind of explain to people i'm really good at land managing and okay at real estate you know but it's it, it actually works pretty well because a lot of our clients are non-residents. They're ab sort of absentee landowners, so they're depending on me, you know, 
to watch for CRP contracts, deal with the farm tenants, you know, look for opportunities and also tell them, hey, I think this farm has become more valuable than how it's, you know, how it's currently placed in the market. We should look at marketing this one and let's reach out and find a new project. So, sure. um, and I guess the other thing I've, d- I've been able to do it for so long, I'm able to look at a farm that's a cattle pasture farm and see the end product. And then it's on me to sort of paint that picture for these guys. And then given a three to five year window, make it happen. You know, just out of curiosity, Steve, how many of your outfitting clients have turned into real estate customers? Quite a bit. That's a high yeah. percentage of my of my real estate business, especially in the beginning, came directly from the outfitting business. And actually that's how I, that's how I became a realtor and got into the business and working with Nate's dad. Um, You know, before I had a license or anything, you know, these hunters wanted to buy farms and they'd say, hey, would you mind going over and look at this? Would you mind going over and look at that? What do you think we could do with this and that? And, you know, so eventually I became, I'm like, holy cow, I'm doing all the work anyways and all the you know, the liabilities on me as far as from their standpoint. So I said, I, I want to get into this professionally and, you know, take it to another level. So well, I, I, mission accomplished. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Nate, I, I mean, you guys obviously are, are brokering these deals that, that Steve has uh, regardless, I guess, how has he fit into the metrics uh, just in general? Cause I mean, realistically you got to live and breathe in subject matter expert in, in an agent, you know, for the firm. And I think that that's one of the things that our team is, is known for is everybody has their own specialty, um, you know, and, 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 or they can be, you know, uh, active in different things, but they know exactly where their heart is. And then who picks up the slack here and there, you know, if I'm struggling with one thing or, or if I need to know something about an area, Steve's one of the guys I go to. If we're going to look at timber, for example, Steve and I just walked a farm the other day, um, specifically because we thought there was some potential for some timber there. And Steve, that's one of the things he's working. He cuts timber himself. Um, and works in that every day. So that's one of the things that fits into, and sometimes it may mean Steve's in the field and I'm back here helping do some paperwork or meeting with somebody. Um, so again, it goes back to our team aspect and then also uh, being the fact that somebody can come to me for one thing, but you know, if I don't have it, I'll reach out to another team member. And Steve's one of the ones that he's got so much focus on the, the land management side. He's doing a lot of stuff for us. He looks at a lot of our farms and then also trying to imp- implement plans on my own farms um, or family farms that uh, we want to kind of develop. And um, Steve's, you know, the one that kind of we lean on from that standpoint and then who I learn from. Sure, sure, sure. So Steve, as you've transitioned, you know, from outfitter focus i guess right. and, and to your point now you got some guys that you trust running the business yep. or, or helping you run the business um what's your strategy for real estate moving forward i mean wh- what do you see happening in the market maybe not just here but just in general i mean you've been doing it long enough that that you've got to see the the change over time too yeah i think you know as relative to the market right now i think we're at a time where you know the prices are going to kind of plateau you know i think the the market's going to hold. We had an unbelievably crazy run up in the past 18 months, and I don't expect that to continue. So I think it's going to be a, there's going to kind of, I think a lot of the transactions that I'm involved in are going to be somewhat lateral moves where a guy, you know, we've built out this farm, we can sell it, we can buy something worth the money, but there isn't going to be the buy it and expect a 50% increase in the next right. year. And I tell everybody that don't, you know, don't use what we've had recently going forward because i think you'd be disappointed so yeah um, I, and i think we're seeing that everywhere yeah, right yeah i mean it's it's and and it's not really interest rates that have upset the apple cart it's just i mean i, I just think we had such a demand and everybody just bought so fast it's back to normal i mean we're still going to have all the transactions it's just it's a slowdown that generally happens in real estate it's a commodity that goes up and down like corn soybean wheat absolutely all that stuff it's just that little tick in the graph i mean it's if you're in it for the long haul you're still going to make money yeah yeah absolutely well and i think we've also gotten to a point where people push the threshold and when values are climbing people continue to push the threshold to a point to where it can't get there 
And then all of a sudden you start burning people out. And then there's where things start slowing down a little bit too, you know, is just the fact that, you know, corn and bean, you know, that situation, the row crop deal is still very active, but you know, this kind of property that we're talking mostly about is the one that's, you know, affected by attitudes, you know, and somewhat, I'm not going to go pay that kind of price for that thing. We'll wait and see what happens. Now more of the income is coming into play than it was the last 18 months. Yes. You know, it's yep. the, the income to value it, not just because it's got a 200 inch deer on it. Right. It's uh, the income's coming into play a little bit more. And that's where, you know, Steve and, you know, even your guys' business as a whole can help people get to that point where they maximize their dollars for the farm. Yep. And I've noticed a transition in that. I would say of the farms that I have sort of sovereign control of managing for other people I mean I definitely take their input but they trust me enough that I can run with it I'd say 80% of those guys are first focus now is income and then the second focus would be you know big deer and stuff like that they definitely want both but the you know if we're doing projects right now we're doing them to try to improve the income because obviously they know the more income they get, the more land they can own. So I think that's, and that's a big change. 10, 15 years ago, people wanted woods, timber, deer. You know, they didn't really worry about income. They didn't think about that. Now it's definitely, you know, the tables have tilted a little bit. Well, I think just it, it's it's human nature, right? I mean, inflation's up, the market's down. Uh, wh- where's a safe play? Well, I, I, I'd have to argue land's probably going to be the safest Absolutely. play f- forever. Yep. Um, whether the market's up or down, and I'm talking the land market. Yep. But when when we're talking about farms that take a lot of discretionary income to own because they're not even close to cash flowing, uh, you better have a value prop bigger than, hey, I just have this listed. Right. And, and I think that's probably where you're going to capitalize yep. over, call it the softer market that, that we're moving into. Yeah, I agree. When I think that lateral stuff that you were talking about, you know, you said you're going to see a lot of land guy or buyers making lateral moves, not, and why do they do that? Well, they hook up with a guy like you sure. who has improved the right. property yep. and, and now you have a finished product more. Right. Well, now you can take that finished product and laterally move it into somebody else's that maybe was finished 10 years ago. Right. So it was already at the peak of its, of its value. Sure. You know, and to have a guy like yourself that knows um, there's no disrespect to any row crop stuff, but not a lot of people know the timber aspect. So right. to have a guy that can yep. go in and say, I can improve the value of that timber. And I think we hit on it. We hit on it with you at one point in time. You know, a uh, guy goes in and they log all their stuff. Okay, their land value goes down then. Well, if you log it properly, yeah, it you can still take down. you can still Absolutely. take money out of the property and income while still maintaining right. your land value. Yep. Yeah, your your basis. And w- one of the great ways to do that is, you know, managing the timber, you know, the harvest, and you know, figure out what your goals are, what you have there. But then always do the harvest conservatively. But then follow it up immediately with like TSI edge feathering and that's a great way that you can show a potential new owner that hey yes we did harvest some timber you know realized some gain from that but but then we reinvested went back in did a TSI cleaned this place up made it better for the future and that's that's the thing we do the most and that's what I do on my own land you know is try to try to use that it's um that way I feel like I am giving back. We're not just taking from the forest. That's one thing in this area, especially, and typically farmers are not good at. Like they view the the timber and the woodlands as like the enemy sort of. So, you know, anything that happens there, they don't care about. They're not looking at it like, oh my gosh, I'm cutting 16 inch walnuts for a hundred bucks a piece. Mm -hmm. These things are, you know, rate of return is better than the stock market if I leave them here, you know? So that's kind of where go into a landowner and say, hey, you know, we've got these trees. We need to, you know, do a crop tree release, you know, give these some space. Then when you go to show that farm in the future, they're not, they may not be marketable trees now, but they're 20 years from that. And somebody that's seen that you've done the work and and actively encouraged these to grow, that's part of the investment. So, you know, we've had, we've had a really positive response to cutting timber conservatively and then following it with a TSI and it has no negative value and some positive value to the sale price. Mm-hmm. So 
Well, well, and and they that's used a management to give away play. timber. I mean, right, right. It wasn't that long ago, really, where it, Northeast Iowa in particular, they said, well, I have, it's a 40 and 30 acres of its tillable and there's 10 acres right. of timber. They're like, well, you can give me this for the tillable, and, but you have to take the timber too. Right. You well, know, and, and that's all kind of evolved now. Yeah, like down in this country, a lot of people don't know, but a lot of our bigger tracks of state land were was land that people, when times got tough, just let go back for taxes. Wow. They just stopped paying for it, and it reverted back to the county, which then transferred to the state. And that's how a lot of our bigger blocks of public land got started that way. Sure, so. sure. Well, and, and, and we, we've hit on this on multiple podcasts. I mean, it, it's one thing to, to squeeze the orange until the juice quits coming right. out, but done properly the juice keeps coming you know and and i think you brought up walnut trees that's a great example i mean if if people can get educated on understanding the value of leaving that 18 inch walnut uh 10 years later all of a sudden they might be looking at a three four five thousand dollar tree you know and 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 it's hard to see that without somebody coaching them like you steve well and and just on that side when you're managing those farms the coaching is the history that you have. Absolutely. It's, uh, you know, when, when, you, when that thing goes to market, I mean, you got more marketing material from whether it's two years or 30 years of managing that farm that is more information than any, any other real estate company is going to have out there for, right. for that buyer to buy and for the seller to gain on. It's, uh, I mean, it's a huge... It gets me excited, uh, you know. Well, and I think it's as important as, I mean, if, if you went in and retiled a farm, right, th- there's importance to that for the row crop sure. side. What we're describing in, in the timber stand improvement and in selective harvest of, of logs, it's the same thing. Right. It's the same strategic play you're putting into that farm, you know, in your timber as yep. you would with good tillable ground. So I think it's just as important. It just doesn't get near the people don't talk about it well it's it's a value added from a long-term more long-term approach and and in today's world it's it's harder to look at that long-term approach but having a professional there to look at that and say this may not be you know a huge deal but if you take the time this is going to be an asset in the future and or you know again setting your goals is probably one of the biggest things is if you're not planning to be there you know you may not care but long term somebody's going to care so that's the big point is it may not mean anything to you but it's going to mean something to somebody um so that's why it's important well i think people forget right you cut a hundred year oak tree down you're not replacing it overnight um heck your great grandkids might be able to enjoy it the the way we got to but um and i think that's the first thing we look at too and we're when we're on a farm i mean you only get to cut a tree once right um you better make it worth cutting it so Anyway, we don't have to... Well, no, and the, on one final thing on the timber stuff that, you know, that, like, I really try to pride myself on. It's not purely just the understanding of timber, but it's bringing all the players together. So if you're working with a landowner who's new to timber, they're not going to understand the tax implications of timber, and there's some great advantages from that point. They're not going to understand, basically, the language that a forester is speaking So even though, you know, I'm definitely not an accountant and I'm not a professional forester, you know, I try to bring everybody to the table and be the person that that has, you know, the most working knowledge on all concepts and then bring in the experts on each field to get them and then act as that liaison for the landowner. And that's where we've had our most success. Sure. Well, I think loggers, I think loggers have got a bad rap through the years because in some cases they do go and cut everything because they're all they're wanting to do is sell logs right and and i think a lot of it is misinformed from the person they're cutting for correct Correct. as much as you think yes well i mean that's like the fox guard in the hen house (laughs) but you know if you go in there and mark them and have a strategy of what you want out of it that changes that timber harvest yeah and that's the most important thing like when you when we walk a timber either prior to you know a client buying it or after the sale you know the first thing to figure out is what truly are our goals you know is our goal 
money now okay if that's it then we're gonna have to do it this way if our goal is hey we really want to encourage white oak regeneration we're gonna have to knock back some of these other species we're not gonna make as much money doing that but have a clear list of goals and then make a plan to accomplish them like that and there's a lot of loggers that you know get a bad reputation it is a hard business you know what I mean here we fight with mud you know so those guys are sit like we're working on a project in Missouri right now and today those guys are sitting you know and they can't do anything because it's just too muddy to scale yeah. too muddy to get around but the other thing is if the landowners and we've had landowners do this especially when they're being paid on shares they're like just do it get it you know so those guys are going to trash the farm at the landowner's request but the loggers always get the blame the neighbors Absolutely. say oh those oh, guys trash the farm those yep. guys trash the farm and i only cut my own timber just it's my own stuff maybe a, a good friend slash client i'll cut my own and i pick away at it but if if my skitter has to sit for 10 days because it's muddy so be it that's not my main thing that truly cutting timber is actually as like the guy running a chainsaw that's like my hobby you know it's not my clear and best use of my time but i love it so i'm gonna keep doing it sure but uh but i do know i see the stress on those other guys logging when they're like oh my gosh we got to get these trees out it's muddy it's we got you know that's a very stressful thing and and the loggers always catch the blame even though sometimes they might not have been the one that was calling the shots but right well, and no one controls mother nature right i mean the logger wants right. to get out of there just yeah as they much want to be done want too out, right yep. and i have some guys trying to get on some stuff up around us and they're like no we're not going sure. in there because they know i'm picky right like you will not leave ruts going down these side hills and that are eventually become sure. a crater yep and they're like there's no frost right. there was snow in there there's no way we're going to be able to go in there and have any productivity so i've even had to you know change some of the schedule because we usually kind of log on schedules and um you know hey we're right. gonna have to do this this summer yep you know? Yeah, and usually usually a contract, you know, and, and this catches a lot of our landowners by surprise, but they'll ask for maybe two years to cut it yep. because some species due to quality can only be cut in the winter when there's no sap in it. But then if the winter's like this where there's no frost, you really don't want them in there. So that's why some of these contracts are written with some longer lead time. So All makes sense. All makes sense. Now let's talk to – don't get me wrong. I love oh, talking no, no. about yeah. timber. Yeah, no worries. Um, <laughs> I want to hear about the hunting season. Steve, walk us through uh, your season personally, but also the the business side of it. Straight air, how'd you guys do? What'd you see? What are your synopsis of the season? You know, it's the I've never had a season where through the different times of year we hunt, we basically hunt archery, the gun seasons, and late muzzleloader. Archery was terrible. I would probably say it was the on a, if we judge the season on deer taken and recovered, I would say it's probably one of our worst, which is hard to believe. We everybody focuses all their energy on that first week in November we went like 10 days in the 70s it just was really really tough but after that we went into our gun seasons and we've never had we take I think we took six guys each the week we killed each week we killed five wow you know five out of six biggest one each week was in the 180s I mean we killed some high-end nice deer it was high quality hunting and I was shocked that it could be that different you know so what would you attribute that to? I mean, I, I get we were warmer than average in, in the first part of November when most people, per se, are taking rutcation. Right, right. But, I mean, is there anything you can point at, Steve, and be like, I think this is what happened? I mean, you've been doing it for a long yeah, time. Yeah, what, what one of the things that I think got us is that we, we just had a consistent south wind for so long. We burned out a lot of our good setups, and then that problem just kept, you know, we had stands we never hunted, and we're real careful to hunt on the wind. And then we're always trying to every when you get in a situation like that, you got to be super proactive and try to hang new sets even during the season, just so we're keep always, it fresh. Just always hunting fresh stuff, and and then you know throw in we had some you know deer shot that weren't recovered, and that soaks up a lot of our our time, our resource of time, because if we feel it's dead, we'll keep looking for it till we find it, you know, and um, like a gut shot or something like that. And this year there's just a lot of those things going on at the same time. But then the gun season, we didn't have, in first or second gun, we didn't have what I would call stellar weather. It was like, you know, 20s and 40s. But I don't know if the rut actually was still going a little bit later because we did exceptionally well. I was really, you know, really surprised that 
they click that easily. It, it was like night and day from bow season. So wow, and it's unfortunate because you know we want everyone to be successful, but in our mind, like we we try to put we're extra focused during archery season because those guys have invested five or six years for that yeah. tag. Right. You know, and I appreciate that. I go on hunts out west, and I I know you're you have a different mindset when it's taken ten years to draw a tag than it's something you can draw every year or every other year. You know, and and that's what's that's what's so hard and um yeah that was it was just a strange year and then this late muzzleloader was a really unique season because from opening day till just after christmas it was unbelievably cold snow yep. we only had a couple people in camp everybody got one it, and we killed some big deer i actually killed one that week myself it was one that uh we'd been hunting on a farm that we managed for the last well, we've had the farm for five years, and that deer had been big for five years. Wow. Just a big, he was a big eight. He'd actually, unfortunately, in the last two years, probably lost 15 inches. At his peak, he was about 160-inch eight-pointer, and I think he was 148 when I got him. But so still it big. It was just cool to have the history. You know, we got all the sheds, got all that. And big eights. Yeah. And one thing that I was happy with that, you know, we had zero daylight pictures of him in the food plot. Huh. But once that cold spell came, he was there in the daylight. That shows the importance of hunting those, whatever you got to do Front, to hunt yeah. in that sub-zero. It was blowing 40 miles an hour that night. Yeah. It was, it was tough. It was an interesting season because, I mean, that, that cold – well, I think I think the rest of November was exceptionally colder cold, than normal. Yes. Uh, so not only did they rut hard right. um, and had pretty good rut conditions sure. other than, other than uh, the what I would call season. week one yep. or the prime yep. week. Uh, I think they were run down, and then you layer gun season on, and then you layer on, you know, an Arctic blast yep. um, in late December. I mean, it it put them on the skids. We we were already seeing deer grouping up big time. Sure, you know the food plot fills up to seventy, and you're like, oh boy, right? This, this food plot ain't gonna last very long. No, but, no, that's definitely one of the challenges. And now they're shedding early. So, God bless the fact that season's over. Uh, anybody that's gonna run the the antlerless late doe season or whatever they call it here in Iowa, be careful. Yeah, very careful, look, for sure. Look 10 times, not twice, but. That's that's for sure. Or so, stay home. Yeah, or stay <laughs> home. <laughs> <laughs> there's, some, there, there's still some, well, I can't even say that the national championship was a train wreck. Uh, that was not a good game. Um, but we're looking forward to the Super Bowl. How's that? Yeah. So, Steve, I'm going to ask you, uh, every outfitter I ever talked to, I, I got a couple things I want to ask yeah. you on. And this, these are more experienced. So, the age-old debate, when, you, when you're running an archery camp, do you have a broadhead rule? I mean, are you a fixed guy, uh, a mechanical guy, and why? If I, if I was – that's a great question. If I – my own personal rule, I don't like mechanical broadheads at all. And through guiding, I've seen them do some really odd stuff. I've, you know, very inconsistent from, you know, unbelievably large blood trails to none to literally ones deploying and skipping off the side of a deer. We've had all that happen. But the problem is I don't want someone coming here that's got a setup that works for them to have to change and redo everything. You know, it's it's more of a thing. So we don't have a rule about broadheads. But what we do is, you know, definitely coach people that, hey, you know, you're shooting a mechanical. You can't be shooting straight down at these deer. You know, you've got to pick some different shots. And the biggest thing is telling people, um, especially with the mechanical, but this applies to everything. I think people hug the shoulder too much. I think, you know, people don't realize that you have about six inches behind the shoulder to be right dead center in that kill zone and definitely stay off that shoulder a little bit because... And in the event you hit them a little further back, you know, a liver, even worst case scenario, gut, we usually recover those deer. You know, those deer we recover. Those deer hit from the shoulder, neck, high, you're not going to get those deer. So Most personal the live. personal preference, yep. you're a fixed blade guy. Absolutely. But to your point, you don't have a hard and fast rule at straight air. No, no, mainly because it it's so many people with today's bows and stuff struggle to get a lot of the fixed blades to fly. Perfect you know? tune, right? Yeah, so... Yep. And, you know, I've guided out west and stuff. I help some buddies. I help elk hunt almost every year. And I've seen some amazing shots made and, you know, shot clean through an elk with mechanicals if it's done properly. So sure. we try to be a resource and just coach people and make sure they understand. A lot of times these people are coming from the south or the east where their deer may be half the size of ours. And a shot that works there won't work here. So, 
you know, we try to make sure they, they get the hang of that. Nope, so, makes sense. I think makes it goes sense. down to granddad when they're teaching their, you know, grandkids how to hunt. Put her on the front shoulder and pull the trigger. Right. I mean, that, right. that's ingrained into everybody's head growing mm, up. Yeah. And and when you have that deer out there, it's just, just – Every 3D target has. Well, that's what uh, I thought. Yeah, right. They have that's it what right I was just going to say. I was, yep. I was just going to say the three. I, my thought was it's the 3D companies and stuff. They've pushed that kill zone, that 12 ring, so far forward that that's where everybody's brain is going, you know. And and when you and it's fine, but you know, deer are never at perfectly broadside. You know, you got all those different angles at play, so. Well, it's fine until you shoot a 240 inch deer and don't recover yes. it, but we're not going to yeah, talk about that. That's unfortunate. Um, the other <laughs> easy, Trav, easy. Um, the other question I had, and, and again, outfitter hat on sure. Steve, <clears throat> what is your rule on a marginal shot, or let's just say a gut shot? Uh, if a client comes to you and says, Hey, I, I hit him back, I hit him in the middle, whatever, what is your hard and fast rule on, on that shot? And you know, like we go through an orientation when people arrive and Again, talk about the broadheads and shot placement and stuff like that. But, and then also it's sort of like a what if. And if someone says, hey, you know, I was aiming six inches back, like you said, four inches back, but I think I hit a, a foot back, you know, don't even look for the arrow, climb down, sneak out. And nowadays, with most of the hunters, most guys have on X on their phone and stuff. And you just have to explain to somebody, hey, if that deer went this way, and that's the way you were used to coming out. Just go the other way. Just walk 300 yards, and then we'll find you. You know, call me, and we'll pick you up. But whatever you do, don't disturb that spot because that deer more than likely didn't go far and bedded. And then if we just back out, come back the next morning, we have a high chance of recovery. And we have a tracking dog now. He's kind of new and young, and um, but that's going to help speed this process up as well, you know, for, for deer like that. Um, but as far as our policy, on a deer like that where – in my mind, that deer is mortally wounded. We won't hunt until we're positive it's not dead somewhere on our farm. And that's where we're hoping that the tracking dog helps out because it just keeps us from having to literally man walk the whole entire farm and ruin, you know, you might ruin a 400 acre farm during the peak of the rut because you know that deer is dead somewhere. Yeah. So. Yep. So hard and fast rule, you're, you're leaving them overnight regardless Absolutely. or giving them. If, if yeah. there's any question on the shot whatsoever. Yep. And that's a good, a good rule of thumb, except you know, where you have to make an ethical decision is if it is really warm, then, you know, you might, you may have to track to see if it is by some chance dead short because it'd been unfortunate to lose all the meat and everything if it was dead right there. Sure, sure. Well, we, we got a good friend that outfits in Montana and, and th those two questions are things yeah, we've talked sure. about a lot and, and he's more elk. Um, but one thing he said is he would link 90% plus of their lost animals he said if there's one thing i can point at it's it's mechanical broadheads mm. now he's kind of like you what, steve right? he's not for or against because right. he, he could tell the we, we've questioned it and said well how many died because they got shot with mechanical right. that wouldn't have invite you know right. we're sure. not even going to get into that but the 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 one thing he said and it's kind of always stuck with me is he said my odds of recovering a gut shot animal are, are over ninety percent. Yes, yeah. I would he goes say. if if we can do it right, it, it's over ninety percent. But he goes if we bump it once, he goes I think the number goes down to less than thirty percent right. recovery. Yep, I would agree with that. Yeah, I just I, I I'm always curious. Uh, yeah. you guys get to see so many different scenarios. Um, I want to learn from it. Yeah, you know if, if there's something I can per se put in my quiver, I want to put it in my quiver. Well, sure. I mean, just look at the evolution of tracking now we have drones I right mean, we found a giant giant this year with a drone i mean it's 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 getting to the point where now the infrared and all that other thermal stuff are coming up you know the dog's a little better companion than a flying drone but <laughs> uh it's i mean i was going to ask you what you had uh if you had a dog or anything yep. like that on but i mean you answered that question before i asked it but i think you know, when somebody's looking for an outfitter, that's one of the questions. Yeah. I, I mean, I ask right away. I mean, do you have a dog or access to a dog in case somebody in our hunting party makes a, you right. know, you know, not a great shot? And it, it, it makes when you're waiting, like you said before, Steve, that four to five years right. to get that tag. It just 
increases your odds of recovery. Well, if he's dead tonight, he's going to be dead in the morning. Exactly. Right. That's, yeah. that's exactly. the biggest yeah. thing. And then, you know, the one – the one part about the other part about leaving them and the importance of not bumping them or pushing them. I mean, we have big farms, but this is still Iowa. This isn't Montana. These aren't hundred thousand acre farms. So we may be able to use the dog on our land, but the way the law is now, you don't have, someone could track a deer without a weapon, you know, if they have blood, yep. but you can't take a dog. So that, that's still a concern. You know, we usually have pretty good relationships with our neighbors and they know we're not going to, if it's a grazing shot that there's just a drop of blood, we're not going to take a dog and track out their whole place, sure. you know, but, um, but that is something, that's another reason it's always better to wait if, if you're not sure. And when I mean, what's so hard for people to tell them that and everybody in their mind says, Oh yeah, yeah. But then pretty soon it's like, they want to get their arrow. They want to, you know what I mean? And I'm like, no, just leave it. And the reason that's so critical is that when that dog hits that trail, if he can if he can start you can walk him to the arrow and have him take off from the arrow and go he's on fresh sign if you walk around you're inadvertently stepping in the blood and creating side blood trails sure you know that that much sense so it's so important for them to be able to do what know, they're supposed to track do. on a on you know the dogs the dogs have a most tracking dogs that people might you know call in and hire somebody they have a tough job because usually people have exhausted every resource Before. trying to find it first we prefer nope we don't even look we'll go back tomorrow morning with just the dog the hunter and the guy who uh, one of our partners ellis said the dog is kind of his thing and responds to him so um he'll be the one to track it so. i did the whole dog thing for a while my dog can do it but that's exactly why i quit <clears throat> people would call and they'd be like oh i had a guy call last night it was 8 8 8 30 you know darn well he looked for, for a while last three hours right and i'm like ah, i'm leaving tomorrow morning i'm gone all week i'm out right um but you know guys the back out thing and just calling a guy that has somebody that or some dog or anything to to track so crucial in yeah. finding that deer i know you want to find it yourself and you're jazzed about it but most guys know when they made a bad shot 100 percent. like they know it was back just just quit and to your point walk the opposite direction right don't walk anywhere close to yeah, blood because you might bump it just by trying to get out of there yeah and that's people are like i've just watched my dog do circles and they'd be like oh your dog doesn't know what he's doing i'm like where did you walk yeah right and they're like well we were we were canvassing right here looking for blood i said well look at him he's following you right because you were stepping in it you know and and those types of things and it's an awesome asset to have in your camp right you know and to be able to control that environment a little bit by being <laughs> these are my guys you right. will you this will get out this right. is how you do it yep. and man you'd feel i'd feel way more comfortable in camp just like you're Absolutely. saying just Absolutely. knowing hey i can back out yep I can I can come back and they have a dog and here we go. And you know one other little you know kind of trick that we do is if we do go in and track thinking hey it's a good hit it's probably dead right over the hill here we'll turn on our on X and anybody that's with us turns on their on X and then we lay down a track wherever we look so that if, if we say okay this one may not be dead right now we're going to back out then we can take the dog to the head of that and not waste his time retracking what we've tracked and put him on fresh good sign because it seems like and this dog's young he's going to get better but seems like when he gets on it the first time he'll run it as far as he can and he's psyched about it and then once he loses it and then he start then he starts getting confused and bored and you know but it's like he has his the, the first run you let him do is the best chance of him finding that deer so no, I think I love these conversations because there's always something you pick up on and, you know, yep. a, a little granular piece you, you put in your memory bank. The other thing I wanted to ask you about, Steve, because I think this is this literally does play into into your management background, your hunting background. Um, there's a fine line between outfitting and managing and, and how those kind of can work together. Yep. What I'm curious about is and, and you've already you already mentioned this most of these guys drawing this tag this is a very coveted zone five right, tag right um and they got four to six years invested in in yeah. that so certainly everyone that's walking into your camp has the expectation of of seeing and or getting a chance to crack a big deer right. now that's where i that's where i want to start this because sure. 
how do you manage that balancing act? I mean, in in a good genetic deer at three years old, he might be a 160 right. or whatever. Right. How do you keep your top end and your, your is, clients that happy? Is the biggest, that is the biggest challenge to the outfitting business. And, um, you know, the one thing that is very helpful in that nowadays is the amount of cameras. I think we run 125 cameras, maybe 150 at the peak of the rut. And so we know what deer are where, and then we'll get an idea. And there's no perfect answer. Sometimes when we get like a three-year-old superstar, we simply just don't hunt there. You know what I mean? If he's coming in every day at this food plot, we'll just be like, there's no way we can tell somebody to pass up 160-inch deer. Right. You know what I mean? Because they're only here for six days, seven days, whatever. But it's crucial to our, you know, to the resource that we do our best to let that deer go. So at that point, we'll simply not hunt that spot. Don't even put them in a don't bad even, spot. Don't right. put somebody in a bad position to, you know, to begin with. And then, and then working through, you know, trying to show them a lot of, a lot of camera pictures and it's easy. Now you can just make a file of shooters, non-shooters, try to do that. It's tougher during the rut because things are moving fast. You know what I mean? The, the, from a management standpoint, the bow hunting is the toughest because obviously they've waited the longest for the tag and the rut just introduces so many more um, variables. I would say the worst case scenario we have is people rattling deer in. It's something about that interaction when they rattle and see something come running in. It's like the, you know, all the, the bow gets moved from selecto kill to whack it. <laughs> a, lot the, a lot of the, a lot of the mistakes we have happen that way, but that is a, you know, that is a real problem. And then like the, um, gun season's a little bit easier. Most of that hunting is the evenings, food plots. You're getting a good long look at the deer. This past week we were sitting with a lot of the guys when there was, when there were spots like that where, oh, there's two, you know, 160 plus mature shooters, but there's also 155 inch 10 pointer. We don't want to shoot. A lot of times we'll just sit with them. You know, it's pretty fun to be out. And, um, you know, I bring my, you know, 15 by 50 Swarovski's that lets me judge in lower light than most people have. Sure. That helps too. But, but the outfitting done incorrectly can be devastating to the resource, unfortunately. Yeah, you knock your top yeah, end yeah, out. Boy, you know, I, see, I see that a lot, you know, and and um, you, you look at what people kill, and it's a whole bunch of two-year-old deer, and I'm like, you're going to ruin this place in no time. You yeah. Know? And the other thing we're thankful for is a lot of these guys have hunted with us for a long time. And, like, the guys that just left, they all had hunted with us um, many times before. They know they just hit a warm week. You know, and they're not going to shoot a smaller buck because it's a warm week. They know it just doesn't work out. They'll come back in two years. They're realistic. They're realistic. You yeah. know. Now that 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 answers the top end because okay. I mean you're doing what you can to to keep them alive. Obviously, right. what about the bottom end, right? So I think everyone sitting here has a, a track of land that that we would consider intensively managed, yep. right? So sure. Uh, it's easy to let a, a superstar go right. in, in hopes that he makes it and you get to hunt him down the road. But on the flip side of that, I think we all deal with that 135-inch eight-pointer that we know is fully mature and sometimes maybe even over-mature in the outfitting business. I, I got to think it's hard to to say, hey, client, you know, shooting this eight-and-a-half-year-old deer is a, a bigger feat than killing a 163-year-old, right? Right, right. And some people actually do get it. You know, we have uh... – you know, we have some guys that, that are, you know, are totally into mature deer. If they're 140 inch eight point or 135 inch eight, and you have the history to prove that they're five years old, they may be psyched to hunt it. And also they may not be psyched to hunt it on the first day, yeah. but on day four, you know, if you tell somebody, Hey, we know there's this big one here, but there's also these two bucks. These are definitely call bucks. You know, we harvested quite a few, um, that way this year. And then my partners actually brought in some friends, like resident guys, early muzzleloader, you know, and, and we shot a couple, what I would call cull bucks, and I almost feel bad calling it that because, you know, we had a guy from Cedar Rapids come down, and he shot this one buck that was, I, it probably wasn't 120 inches, just an old one, had been there forever, and I saw him, they had the deer hanging, and then they started caping it, and I was like, I was like, oh, they must be just keeping the cape, you know, and the guy's like, no, I'm getting it mounted. And awesome. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, well, how cool is that? It's a deer that, you know, when somebody's so in, focused on trophy management that they kind of, you know, look past that deer. But this guy was so psyched. Not only was he happy to shoot it, he was going to mount it. So. Sure. 
it a call or is it a management deer? That's the million dollar question that everybody's been fighting about. It's uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I Management's mean, it's, probably it's, a better I mean, term. I mean, everybody's got their own little what they call it a call deer. I mean, right. a call deer in my book is something you screwed up on and you're just using it as an excuse. Uh, you do see I mean, that a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the deer is one that you you know wanted to take out. Truly, of. have a purpose in why right. you, why you're taking them, right? No, I I, I think but it's one and the same. For some other day. Yeah, I mean, because I, I think you could go on and on and on about call deer. Like, is there even such a thing? Mm-hmm. You know, and and I think there's study after study that would say, truthfully, until they're mature, you don't even know. Right? That would be I mean, that would be my take on it. Yeah. Kurt, and one of the things going to what Steve mentioned is looking at the long term asset you know steve's big deal is you know i have these tracks for a long-term situation and that's where he's got to look at it and and that's where it's it's big you know some outfitters are there and they may not be in business five years from now right um you know but the long term the longevity is built on you know improving things or you know leaving it better to some extent you have to be careful because people are there to kill big deer but like he said is it's sometimes it's a matter of putting yourself in and you know not in the situation where you're going to have to make that uh, uh call for somebody or somebody's gonna have to make it you know they have the opportunity to kill very good deer but maybe not the four-year-old that's going to blow up and um trusting your outfitter and stuff like that and knowing that they have a plan in place is you know the long-term situation sure because do, do you guys have a fine structure or? yeah we do you yep. do okay yeah yep yeah and and like i said we we have to have a minimum so we do things based on score which isn't biologically the best way to do it but you have to have something tangible some so measuring we, stick yeah, yeah so we you know we've gone to that and um but what i you know i think a lot of it the reason it works out better than you would think is a lot of it is managing people's expectation from the beginning. You know, I tell people, Hey, you know, we're doing this like we hunt for ourselves. You know, this is a chance to hunt somewhere where it's being managed. Right. I mean, you're in the game, but that being said, there's no consolation prizes. Yeah. You know what I mean? We well, don't, it's not catch when it release. Gets to, yeah. yeah. When we get to the end of the hunt, we don't shoot all the one thirties and one forties. We've been passing up all week. You know what I mean? I mean, this is a chance for everybody to get to hunt big deer, but everybody has to toe the line, you know? And, and so, you know, when I don't, we don't do trade shows anymore. We're not, we don't need more hunters. We're very fortunate to work off good friends and repeat, but we tell people that up front, you know, this may be a lower success hunt than you're looking for. Because like I said, you know, there's only so many big deer and they don't move every week. And, you know, but I think as long as you lay that out there for people, they can make a decision would they rather go here or go hunt you know in missouri rifle season where they're going to take 25 hunters and kill 25 yeah. you know 120 inch deer you know and it's all what you want there's not a right answer but this is how we do it so sure. i mean i i mean we all go on trips and you know hunting trips around and you come back and people go what'd you get well i, I didn't get anything right i had a great hunt how right. can you have a great hunt without getting anything you well, know, it's just it's just that they can't comprehend you're hitting on something though trab because and, and steve i'm sure you'll be like yes 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 i think people forget that they're paying for a hunt for an experience right? yeah and right. a hunt is yep. an experience right you are hunting to have killed just means the hunt's over. Right, right. right. So, and go kill something. Yep. You know, if that's all you got to do yep. is kill. Yeah, if you want to pay for a kill, go high hunt. That, yeah, Monta- hunt that Montana hunt was probably the most grueling hunt I've ever been on <laughs> for heat. And it was miserable. It was one of the, I mean, top five, the best hunts I've ever been on, and we nobody shot anything. Well, killed anything. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, arrows were were definitely yeah yeah. We'll, we'll leave that to Ben Jackson's podcast, but that's a that's or, a whole other Herpsies. story. Or true, or yeah, Herpsies. I had one there. Yeah, it's weird when a three forty bull elk turns into a two eighty two hours later on Big video. Big white tips, though. Huge white tips. We couldn't see them apparently. Apparently, yeah. No, it's uh, it's all good, but I I do think it's it's perspective, and and if you if you're coaching them guys going into it, um, you probably get the result you're looking. Well, for. Well, I think but, good agents good land managers all the way around are very good it, it it just keeps getting repeated managing expectations yeah you know and to be able yeah. to do that in every facet of what you do right allows you to be very successful because no one's coming in and said oh he sucks because their expectation was so it was unrealistic it's fake yeah you know right. like hey guys this is their realistic expectation this right. is what is 
most feasible. If it goes above, above it, awesome. That's why right. they have yes. averages. Right. You know, it could go below it, but hey, man, it, you know, to be able to understand that is one. Well, if every key. year every client killed a one seventy, right? Well, yeah, that would be that would be different. That's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the one the one thing that does put it in perspective with people, like I would just say, you know, you take the statistics for our um, first gun hunt. You know, it's six guys killed five. Biggest one is one eighty three. Smallest one was like one forty six. It was an eight or nine pointer, so it met our minimum from that standpoint. But you know, I tell people, you know, everyone's not going to get a 180, but like, if you look at that week, your chances went from maybe one in a million to one in six. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and people are like, holy cow, that's yeah. You know, just to hunt somewhere that you could even have the opportunity yeah. at a 180 is pretty special. Yeah. If that's in the, in the discussion, you already won. Yeah. If you're looking for an outfitter, I mean, if, if that's legitimately in discussion, yeah. you hit the right spot. Right. And, and that's, what's so important. Like, you know, managing the pictures year to year, having those files of pictures, because if you can show someone that, hey, these two deer are on the farm, this is the last picture we had of them. We usually get them over here, but it's the rut, so he's going to be over here. You know, then they're invested and they're in the game. They know what they're waiting for. If you just dump somebody out and, you know, then you can't be mad if they shoot a 150-inch 10-pointer because... You Might be the biggest deer they've ever yeah, seen in their they life. Don't, they didn't know what they're supposed to be looking for. So. Absolutely. So, and that's where my partners are really good. They're very, very good at the cameras, very good at the technology of making shared albums and all this and that. And, sure. you know, that's one of those strengths that those guys definitely brought to us. I mean, you don't, you aren't an expertise in computers uh, and no, no, apps. I, uh, no. You stick to the chainsaw. They were, they were working <laughs> on the books. The guys were working on our year end books the other day and I just saw them. <laughs> this is a true story. And, uh, <laughs> and they had everything on a spreadsheet. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. What kind of program is that? And they're like, uh, Excel. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. I've never seen that before. Looks interesting. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, that looks handy. They're like, yeah, in the 1980s. So well, like, like they, so they always say. Spiral notebook is, you know. That's what I am. Good. I'm a yellow yeah. notepad guy. Yeah. I got yellow Stay in your notepads. lane. Yeah. Stay exactly. in your lane. Yeah. No, that's great. Well, I think uh, we'll get this thing wrapped up, guys. But um, if anyone's looking for a good hunt in Iowa, I think uh, yeah. look Steve up, look his crew up. I, I think you'd be in, in good hands. Uh, the other side of it, if if you're interested in land, especially in southern Iowa. Yeah, uh, I'd love to help you. Steve's your expert. Yep. No, thank you, guys. Thank you. Would you say he's an expert? Absolutely. I lean he's on your, him a he's lot. He's your expert. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, thanks, guys. We'll wrap this one up, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, thanks for guys. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of the Stand on Your Investment podcast presented by UC Hunting Properties and Expedition Land Management.